Hey, North Park Huron, it is so great to be back together again today. It's Sunday again, and we are here. We're together. So thank you for being here today. It's been another wild week uh, in the province of Ontario, for sure. If you've been listening, and I know that you have, uh, more announcements this week coming from the government about reopening, things we can do now. And so many of you have been uh, obviously watching the announcements around uh, the government and churches and so you heard this week uh, that now churches are allowed to open uh, to 30% of their capacity. And I'm sure that excites uh, many of you. It excites us for sure. We see stuff is slowly opening. Uh, but as a senior leadership team and as an elder board and as, our, as a staff, uh, we've definitely been doing lots of talking about this. And we've kind of decided that at this time, we're not going to be uh, reopening for weekend services on site at any of our campuses. There's lots of things to consider, how people get in the buildings, how people get out safely. We've got three different buildings to kind of process how we work that through. We've got three different sizes of congregations, three different kinds of buildings. There's lots of things that we need to think through in order to be able to come back together in a way that we can celebrate and be around each other and do it safely. So we're not there just yet. We're probably thinking around September. But as we think about that, we are going to be processing every month. As the government continues to make more announcements, uh, we're going to continue to process this. But until then, we're going to continue to do our online uh, pieces, our online uh, weekend services, our online weekday pieces that you've been kind of jumping in on, uh, here on groups, all that stuff. We're going to keep doing that in uh, the next few weeks as we kind of lead into summer and as we lead into September and then we'll, we will see where we are. It is going to be exciting days and we can't wait to be back with you. So in a moment we're going to jump into the teaching for today. The, today's teaching is going to take us back to the main campus again today and we're going to look at uh, what Pastor Paul is saying about, uh, about isolation and about uh, John's experience on the Isle of Patmos. It's going to be a great message. You're not going to want to miss it but I'm going to be back next week jumping into a brand new series that I'm excited about and it's called Stuck in the Middle with You. And I'm sure lots of you have felt like you're stuck in the middle with someone in these days. Uh, but we're going to be talking about liminal space. Stuck in the Middle with You. God's truth about liminal spaces. It's going to be a great series. We're going to have some biblical teaching. We're going to have some interviews from people who have kind of went through some interesting spaces in the last couple of months. You're not going to want to miss it starting next Sunday. So be sure you come back here for that. You are going to love it. It's going to be great. So for now, we're going to jump into our teaching time today at the main campus with Pastor Paul. God's blessings on you. I trust that you're well, your family's well, and it won't be too long that we will be together again. So brace yourself. God's word's coming at you and it's coming at you right now. Well, hello everyone. Welcome to North Park's online worship service. My name is Paul McRae, teaching pastor. Well, the year was 1922 in England. A young Eric Blair with no idea what he wanted to do with his life actually decided to follow in his father's footsteps and he joined the Indian Imperial Police, went on to serve in the country of Burma. Now, by all accounts, he hated every moment of it finally returning to England just five years later at the age of 24. Now lacking ambition and possibly depressed, he retreated to a bedroom in the family home, and he took refuge there for almost a year, emerging in 1928 when he declared himself a writer, and he headed off to Paris to explore this newfound passion. Today we know Eric Blair as George Orwell, one of Britain's greatest writers, whose books such as Animal Farm and 1984 remain influential in pop, pop culture even today. So what exactly happened during that year of self-imposed exile, alone in his bedroom, because the transformation was remarkable? It's like this sheepish, self-pitying Eric disappeared into his bedroom one day, only to materialize a year later as the tenacious and prophetic writer George Orwell. Well, by Orwell's own account, during this year, he simply gathered up all the books that he could find that were written by Charles Dickens. He was transformed by reading the likes of David Copperfield or A Tale of Two Cities or Great Expectations. Immersed in these stories, Orwell developed a passion to be a crusader for the poor and for the disenfranchised. These stories changed him, and they also changed the direction of his life. And his own books offer an uncompromising critique of the world around him, but they also contain within their pages hope that there is a better future. 
Perhaps you, like me, first experienced George Orwell in high school English class where 1984 was required reading. Now imagine the luxury of just having a year in exile in your bedroom just to read books. Now for some of you, that's a dream come true. Perhaps you've had more free time during the past three months of this pandemic where you can do a little bit more reading, and that's been a silver lining in the midst of this uncertain time. But ponder this, if you will. If a year of reading Charles Dickens could have such a profound impact like it did on George Orwell, imagine what reading the Bible or engaging Jesus could do for a person. It would change us and it would change the world. And given what I've seen about the world in the last three weeks, I think it could use a little changing, don't you? Today we're in the third week of this short four-part series at North Park that we've entitled Never Alone, God's Work in Times of Isolation. See, during this global pandemic, many of us have probably felt like we've been in exile. We've been restricted by the government, restricted in the places that we can go, the people that we can gather with, how many people we can gather with. We're separated from those people and those activities that are meaningful for us. At times like this, we can become so focused on our predicament that we sometimes forget that God can do a deep work in our lives in those moments that we maybe feel alone. A careful scan of Scripture reveals that there are examples of people that were alone, people who were in isolation, people who were in exile, seemingly cut off from the world, and yet God uses those times to grow their faith and their reliance on Him. Two weeks ago, you may remember, we looked at the life of Elijah and the amazing things God did through his lonely times. Last week, Matt shared with us from a boat the life of Joseph and the way that God was at work in his isolation. And today we come to the experiences of John as revealed to us in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. So if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me there to the book of Revelation. Now, through research and study, biblical scholars believe that the book of Revelation was written by the Apostle John. Now, John was Jesus' beloved disciple, and it's thought that it was written around the year 96 A.D. John is now in his mid-80s. He's in exile on the prison island of Patmos, located in the Aegean Sea. Now, that's located just 10 miles off of the coast of what is today Turkey. So why was John on the island of Patmos? Well, the Roman government of this day had rock quarries on Patmos, and criminals or troublemakers were often sent there as punishment to do hard labor. Let me explain it this way. Throughout the first century after the death and the resurrection of Jesus, life as a Christian in the Roman-dominated world was difficult. In around 67 AD, the Roman emperor Nero was feeding, literally feeding Christians to lions. The apostles Peter and Paul were both killed around this time for their faith, but in the year 92 AD, things got even worse for the followers of Jesus. The Roman emperor who ruled the land at this time was a guy by the name of Domitian. Now, he was a profoundly insecure man, as most tyrants are, by the way, but he lived in this constant fear that he'd be overthrown. Now, to compensate for his insecurity, he demanded that all citizens, all subjects of the Roman Empire, would worship him and, and bow down to him as Lord and God. Each day, the people were required by law to go to the temple named in the honor of Domitian to take a pinch of incense, throw it on the altar, and then declare Caesar is Lord. Now, Domitian was that Caesar. And he didn't care what else the people worshipped, just as long as they did this little act of worship towards him. He felt that it was the glue that would solidify his rule. Now, for the Roman citizens, this act was no big deal. They worshipped many gods, so one more god was no big deal. But for a person like John, he couldn't live with this edict. See, he was a follower of Jesus, and to him there was only one true god, and that certainly wasn't Domitian. Now, for failing to abide by this law, the authorities could have sentenced John to death like they did so many other Christians at the time. But John was a prominent leader in the Christian movement, and killing him would have made him a martyr. So insecure Domitian knew that there's nothing that can renew a spirit of a minority movement like having a martyr. So instead of having John killed, he simply had him banished in exile to the island of Patmos, hoping that he would just go there and he would die quietly. Well, John is on exile in Patmos. He heard about the persecution and how it had gotten worse for the Christians. Many of them were being harassed by soldiers. They were losing their businesses and their homes. Some were even being murdered. And on top of all of that, the stress was playing havoc on the Christian church. 
immorality and false teaching and heresy was taking root. Now you can imagine, as John looks out from Patmos across the Aegean Sea towards home, he could only imagine how the Christians were confused. They were discouraged and they were afraid. There was pressure on them to conform, to bow a knee to someone besides Jesus, to conform to the way of the world. Now that's a little background to the context as we come into Revelation chapter 1. Listen as John writes this in hopes of encouraging his Christian brothers and sisters. Revelation 1 at verse 9. I, John, am your brother and your partner in suffering and in God's kingdom and in the patient endurance to which Jesus calls us. I was exiled to the island of Patmos for preaching the word of God and for the testimony about Jesus. It was the Lord's day and I was worshiping in the spirit. Suddenly I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet blast. So John's exiled on Patmos, probably alone in this day, but it's the Lord's day, and so he's worshiping God, much like we do in our worship services when we gather together, maybe leading a, reading a little scripture, perhaps singing a song or two, and no doubt praying about the plight of his brothers and sisters in the faith. So how does the Lord respond to John's worship? It says that he shows up. Suddenly I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet blast. I wonder, has that ever happened to you? You're worshiping the Lord and He actually shows up. Maybe not like a loud voice, like a trumpet blast, but in other ways. Has that ever happened to you? I know for me, it can, I can experience that often when we're worshiping through music, when we're all gathered together, and I just feel this overwhelming presence, like God is with me, and I get choked up, I can't even sing. But it's a powerful experience. What about you? Have you been so profoundly impacted and aware of the Lord's presence around you? Maybe when you're alone, away from everyone else or everything that is familiar. In 1999, I was traveling the back roads of rural... I've got some allergies, I think, so excuse me. In 1999, I was traveling the back roads of rural Nicaragua with a small mission team made up of people, quite honestly, I didn't know that well, we were eight days into the trip. I was away from Carolyn, my young family. We had no communication. Remember, this was back before the days that everyone had a cell phone. Now, I'd never gone more than a few days without talking to Carolyn. At this point, I had this feeling, and remember, I have this capacity that I can catastrophize things. I had this feeling that if anything happened to me, no one would know for days. In fact, they may never find my body. One night I was sitting at a small table at a roadside stand, just enjoying a cold Coke. It was a warm night. I was caught up in my loneliness and my self-pitying. And I just glanced around at the surroundings, and suddenly a random Bible verse popped into my head. It was this one. How I praise the Lord that you are concerned about me again. I know you've always been concerned for me, but you didn't have the chance to help me. Not that I was ever in need, for I've learned how to be content with whatever I have. Now, it's a familiar passage in Philippians 4, but for me it was just reassurance that God was with me, that I'm never alone, that He's always watching over me. And maybe you've had a similar experience that's brought incredible comfort to you in your times of loneliness. That is John in this text. It says in Revelation 1 at verse 10, It was the Lord's day and I was worshiping in the Spirit. And suddenly I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet blast. See, the voice gets John's attention, and he does what we would have done. He turns around to see where the voice is coming from. During this time of exile in the island of Patmos, cut off from everything that is familiar, everything is normal routine of life, anxious and fearful of the events of the world at this time, God reveals himself to John in a powerful way. It's like he pulls back this curtain and he gives John a glimpse of who Jesus is. Let me ask you a question. What do you picture Jesus to look like? If from the stories in the Gospels, what do you picture Jesus to look like? What's the mental picture that you've formed in your mind about Jesus' appearance? Maybe from some of the films or some of the pictures we've seen depicting his life. We can imagine what he looks like or his appearance. He's maybe 30-something has a medium build, he has long brown flowing hair, a beard and a mustache, maybe much like this picture, one of the most famous pictures of Jesus out there. Good looking guy, tan complexion. Now does this fit your image? Remember, if anyone would have known what Jesus looked like, it would have been John. He was one of his closest friends. 
No doubt as John sat on those rock piles in the middle of Patmos, reflecting on the years spent with Jesus, he probably conjured up a picture of Jesus from his memory bank. Oh, there was that time when Jesus turned the water into wine at Cana in the wedding feast. Hmm, what was the picture of Jesus then? Or maybe there was the picture of Jesus turning over the tables of the money changers in the temple. Or, or the picture of Jesus feeding the 5,000 people. Or the one where he welcomes the little children to come to him. Or, or maybe it's the picture of the badly beaten Jesus as he hangs on the cross. Or maybe it's the one as he appears to the disciples after his resurrection. See, each picture of Jesus would have brought to mind a, a source of comfort for John. But in his present predicament, God knew that he needed more. He needed to see Jesus as he is now. As I pondered some of the events of the past three months, this time of exile due to the COVID pandemic, and specifically some of the racial tension and injustice and civic unrest over the past few weeks, it's occurred to me that in our fear and in our anxiousness and in our uncertainty, maybe we need to see a picture of Jesus as he is now. And fortunately, that's what we're given in the book of Revelation at chapter 1. Let's return to the way that John describes this experience of seeing Jesus in the text. Now, it's a description that's full of imagery that would have been meaningful to John, and it would have instilled hope in him. And as I describe it for you today, my prayer is that it instills hope in us as well, in our present circumstances. John says, I heard a voice behind me. See, he's not imagining this at all. He's not hallucinating because he's been out slamming too many rocks in the quarry. This is something that happens that's external to him. It, it was outside of him. He, he heard a voice as clear and as loud as a trumpet. So his natural response, look at it. I turned to see who was speaking to me. Now that's an interesting phrase, isn't it? I turned to see. Have you ever had someone say something to you and you couldn't see their face? Their tone of voice is relaying a certain message to you, good or bad, but you have to see their face to determine exactly what the message is. Now this happens to me in my exchanges with Carolyn. Maybe it's because I always default to the worst case scenario, but as she cries out to me from another room, Paul, I immediately assume there's something wrong. She's hurt and she needs my help. Or, or maybe she's fending off a house intruder. Or, or maybe she's discovered that once again I've eaten all the chocolate that she's been saving for a special occasion. But it's only when I venture to see her, to see her face in the situation that I can properly interpret what her cry means. It may be that she's just summoning me to the bedroom window so I can look out at the deer that are eating our plants in our backyard. Or maybe she's calling me because our grandson Bo has just dialed us up on FaceTime and, and we get to have a meeting with him. Or maybe she is calling me to the refrigerator to point out that I have indeed eaten all the chocolate that she has been saving for a special occasion. But the point is, I don't really know the point of her cry, Paul, until I see her face until I see the circumstances. And that's John in the text. See, he hears this voice behind him, and when he turns, he sees a person. It's that same person that he has lived with and he followed 60 years before. The same person that he has shared so many experiences with, so many memories with, but he's different now. It says he turned and there was someone like the Son of Man. Like the Son of Man. Now, this is an intentional phrase here. He's bringing to mind something that was written in the Old Testament book of Daniel. In Daniel chapter 7 at verse 13, Daniel says this, I saw someone like the Son of Man coming from the clouds of heaven. Now, this phrase, Son of Man, refers to the central figure in all of history, the one to whom all the kingdoms of the world are given. And you may remember that this title, Son of Man, was often used by Jesus to refer to himself. All throughout the Gospels, you see that Jesus refers to Son of Man, and he's talking about himself. Look specifically in the Gospel of Luke. The key point, and the one that John wants us to get here, is that when he turned and he saw the person on this day, it was the Son of Man. It was the central figure in all of history. It's Jesus. And then in verses 12 and 13, we're given some other descriptors of what John saw. The Son of Man, Jesus, he is standing in the midst of seven lampstands. It says at verse 12 and 13, I saw seven gold lampstands, and standing in the middle of the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man. See, 
In this passage are actually some examples that make the writing of the book of Revelation so unique. It's the use of literary devices such as metaphors or imagery or even the use of things like numbers. John says that he sees someone like the Son of Man standing amongst gold lampstands. Now that's so interesting, but what does it mean? Later in Revelation 1, we discover that this imagery of lampstands in this day represented churches, and there are seven of them, so we can assume that they represent the seven churches that John would have been worried about, and the seven churches that he would have been praying for while he was in exile on Patmos. Those churches would have been Ephesus, and Smyrna, and Pergamum, and Thyatira, and Sardis, and Philadelphia, and Laodicea. But as I said, numbers are also important, specifically in the book of Revelation. So seven in this culture would have represented the number for completeness or wholeness. So we can surmise by this vision that God gives to John that Jesus, the Son of Man, is not only standing amongst the seven churches of this day, but he is standing amongst all the churches. Jesus is with the church as a whole. He is with all of his followers. He is standing right smack dab in the middle of the church. Notice he's not hovering over looking down. He's not on the outside looking in. He's there. He is with them and He is with us. He understands and He knows all that we're going through because Jesus is not distant. He's not aloof. He's not operating His church from afar with the use of a remote control. He's not doing it wireless through Bluetooth. And He's with us even today through the power of His Holy Spirit. See, we're not alone even when we can feel like we're in exile. What an incredible comfort this image must have been to John in his situation on Patmos. And this image is meant to bring comfort to us today. Jesus is here in our midst, right smack and dab in the middle of it all. We're not alone and we don't have to handle anything that comes our way by ourselves. You know, just about every week I hear stories of people who are, seem to be hitting a wall given all that we've been going through the last several months. This past week, one person in particular just confessed some insecurity in the way that they were handling some family dynamics and even some work responsibilities. At one point, this guy confessed that he cried out to Jesus and he said, Jesus, I want you to come right here, right now, sit with me and help me figure this out. Now, although he didn't sense that Jesus pulled up a chair at that moment beside him and helped him, it was over the next few days that he experienced Jesus' presence in an undeniable way giving him some practical ways to to move through his doubt and his problems. And it just gave this guy reassurance that Jesus is right here. He is in the midst of our fear. He is there in the midst of our uncertainty. Can you sense that in your life today? In, In the next few verses, John describes Jesus as he sees him. And the first thing, interestingly, that he notices is the way that Jesus is dressed. So again, let me ask you, what's the first thing that you notice about a person? Let me try this with you. Have a look at this picture. What's the first thing that you notice? Or what about this picture? What's the first thing that you notice? Perhaps some of you would say, well, you notice a person's smile, or you notice their eyes, or you notice their hair. But what most of us notice right away is the way that a person's dressed. Now, I'm not sure what that says about us, but it is a natural response. In this passage, John is drawing our attention to the way that Jesus is dressed, and it's important. Remember, nothing in the Bible is happenstance. Nothing is there is just for filler. There is a reason. John is describing the way that Jesus is dressed because the way that he's dressed is conveying a message through his appearance. Have a look at it. He was wearing a long robe with a gold sash across his chest. Now, the long robe brings our attention to something. See, this robe that the now glorified Son of Man, Jesus, is wearing here is a priest's robe, and it would symbolize that Jesus now is the great high priest. Now, here's the interesting thing. Priest in the Latin means a bridge builder. Now, just think about that for a moment. What does a bridge do? Well, it joins two sides that otherwise would be disconnected. Jesus is now the ultimate bridge builder. And not only does Jesus bridge the gap between God and humanity... And, and the, the sin that separates us, not only does Jesus bridge that gap, but he is also the mediator between you and me, between humanity. When there's a disconnect between humanity and our world, when we turn to Jesus, he can help bridge that gap. 
And that's why for all the protests over racial inequality, as well intended and meaningful as they've been over the last few weeks, the only true way that we'll experience harmony with one another is when we receive Jesus and accept Jesus and invite him to be Lord of our life. Our lives surrendered to him allows us to comprehend our differences and then to love our neighbor as ourself. He is the bridge builder. Do you understand that? And notice what's accessorizing this robe. It's a gold sash that's across his chest. Now again, this is so important. John is describing these features for a reason. He knew that in this day, a sash or a belt, if it's worn around the waist, it means that someone is headed off to work. But a sash that extends across someone's chest means that someone has completed their job. Here John and we are reminded that this gold sash that's across Jesus' chest means that his work is done. It is finished. Do you remember that from John 19.30? Jesus has now done all that he needs to do for us to have life, to have true life in him, now and into eternity. We don't have to keep waiting for more, but some of us are, right? We're waiting for more. We keep waiting. We keep living as if we're waiting for more. But no, all that Jesus has accomplished on the cross through his death and through his resurrection, it is finished. We can rest in him now. We can live in him and we can trust in him. Let me quickly point out a few other things that John notices about Jesus' appearance now in this passage and why it's so important. Look at this one. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow. Now, what does this represent? Perhaps this description reveals the agelessness and the wisdom of Jesus. He has been around since the beginning of time and he will be there till the very end of the age. He has been there to see the rise and the fall of the Roman and the Greek Empire, as well as all the other empires of the world. He's been there through Darwinism. He's been there through apartheid and through terrorism. And he is with us today during this COVID-19. And he's with us today during this racial unrest. See, other things may come and go, but he remains. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Nothing ever happens that catches Jesus off guard. His wisdom endures forever. He is perfectly clean. He is altogether holy and pure and sinless. Is that the picture you have of Jesus? That his head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow. Look as the passage continues. And his eyes were like flames of fire. Have you ever heard that expression that your eyes are the window to your soul? See, you can fake a smile, but our eyes, our eyes are a dead giveaway of something deeper going on in our life. If you want to get the full story of something that's going on in a person's life, just look deep into their eyes. I remember a time when one of my children had been crying before they had to go to school and, and they went into their room and they kind of cleaned themselves up and then they came out and they said, can you tell I've been crying before I get off to school? Can you tell that I've been crying? What they were saying is, look at my eyes because my eyes tell the story. Eyes like flames of fire. See, fire purifies. It illuminates. It, it cleanses. The eyes of Jesus not only look at us, they look right through us to the facades and the masks that we put on that help to protect us from the pain and the hurt of our world. Jesus purifies and he cleanses and he comforts us when we keep our eyes focused on him and not on the things of the world. His feet were like polished bronze refined in a furnace. Now that's an interesting imagery, isn't it, for us? But the feet, think about it, the feet are our foundation. And that's why we often call an anchor of a building the footings. I've recently been struggling with some pain in my feet, so every once in a while when I take a step, I'll get a bit of pain that shoots up through my leg, and it causes me to go off balance. Why? Because my foundation is shaken. But Jesus' feet, they're strong and they're firm. They're tested by fire. The foundation of Christ, it is rock solid, unlike any other foundation of anything else. Most of those things, we see them crumble and fall by the wayside. In our generation, we've seen the fall of the Berlin Wall that represented the communist rule in the East. It was founded on a lie and a cracked foundation. Any society that eliminates the living Savior from their belief system will ultimately crumble down. And that's what we see happen all around us, even today. And his voice, his voice thundered like mighty ocean waves. You ever been along an ocean on a rough day and just had the waves crashing down all around you? 
there's power in those waves, isn't there? There's power enough to erode a coastline. In fact, just this week, I saw a video clip on Facebook of this part of land that just eroded and slid into the sea, a part of land that contains several homes. It just slid into the sea in Norway, caused by the power of the water and the waves. But waves are also mesmerizing, and maybe you found that to be true. There's something oddly peaceful and tranquil about them. If you've ever rented a hotel room on the ocean, you know that those waves can lull you to sleep at night. See, Jesus' voice is both mighty, but it's also peaceful. It's calm and it's reassuring, just like ocean waves. John continues with his description of Jesus. It says he held seven stars in his right hand. Now, later we're told that these seven stars represented the seven angels or the seven messengers to the seven churches, but it also has a deeper meaning. In the first century world of John, the seven stars would have been referring to the seven known planets of the day. Astrology was so big in this time. The Roman emperors used to decorate their thrones with stars and with planets, and then they'd call astrologers to come and help them foresee future events. But here in this vision, John sees the seven stars are in Jesus' right hand. Jesus has the stars. See, the planets don't control the world. Jesus does. He controls the planets. The stars don't run our lives. Jesus does. The Son of Man is the Lord of the cosmos. And to quote a familiar song that we used to sing a few years ago, Jesus literally has the whole world in His hands. He held the seven stars in His hand and a sharp two-edged sword came from His mouth. Now the words that come from Jesus' mouth cut right through the rhetoric and they get to the heart of the matter. They divide what is good and what is evil. They overcome the rebellion and they declare righteousness. They are sharp and they're to the point. And then his face was like the sun in all its brilliance. Now in the Old Testament, one of the greatest blessings that a person could receive was to have the Lord's face shine upon them. The description that John uses here makes it seem like it's almost too, too much for him to take in. It's too much for him to describe. That Jesus' face is so warm and brilliant. It's like the sun in all of its glory. This vision of the glorified Son of Man that appears to John while he is in exile on the island of Patmos on this day was so majestic. It was so awe-inspiring. Look at the response that he gives as he encounters this Son of Man. It says that when I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I were dead. John's so overwhelmed. He is so taken by the presence of the living God that he collapses at his feet. I wonder what we would do. If we were to see Jesus as he is today, I wonder what we would do. I wonder what I would do. Am I still amazed by the work of the Savior in my life and in the world that I would fall? I would fall at his feet in worship, or have I simply just grown apathetic? And have I grown cynical of it all? What about you? And as John is laying there, overcome by all that he's experienced, it says that Jesus laid his right hand on me, and he said, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I died, but look, I'm alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and the grave. That same hand of Jesus that held the stars, that controls the world, offered a personal touch to John. See, Jesus doesn't stand in the distance. He is right there. He is in the middle. He's in the middle of the church and, make no doubt about it, He is in the middle of our lives. And He tells John and He tells all of us, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Why? Well, because Jesus has already conquered the greatest enemy that there is. On the cross, He endured all that the evil one could send His way. Oh, death did take Him captive temporarily. But then he broke free from that prison and now he holds the keys to it. Death could not conquer Jesus and it will not have the last word in our lives when we put our faith and when we put our trust in him. See, what Jesus is telling John is that you don't have to be afraid of the Neros of the world. You don't have to be afraid of the Domitians of the world. We don't have to be afraid of the things that seek to rob our lives of vitality like a pandemic or even a tyrannical ruler or even societal unrest. For even if we're persecuted, even if we're condemned, even if we're ridiculed for our faith, Jesus, the living Savior of the world, has come to set us free. 
The text goes on to say that Jesus then commissions John to write down everything that you've seen, everything that's happened in the world and everything that will happen in the world. And that's what forms the final book of the Bible, the incredible book of Revelation. It's all powerful stuff, would you agree? So let me ask you a question again. How do you picture Jesus today? Let me remind you the image of the Savior that's revealed to John on that island of Patmos while he was in exile from Revelation chapter 1. It says he's in the middle of the lampstands, which means Jesus is in the midst of his church. He's clothed in priestly robes, which means he's a bridge to humanity, from humanity to God, and he's a bridge amongst humanity. He has a gold sash across his chest, means it is finished. No longer anything has to be done. His head and his hair are as white as wool and snow. It demonstrates his eternal wisdom and his purity. His eyes like flames of fire, purifying and cleansing. His feet like polished bronze. He is the strong foundation in which we can build our life. His voice like ocean waves. He's strong and peaceful. His right hand holds the seven stars. He is the Lord of the cosmos. Out of his mouth a sharp two-edged sword. It cuts right to the truth. His face shining like the noonday sun. He exudes warmth and he exudes brilliance. His message to us is the very same message as it was to John in his predicament. Don't be afraid. I'm here. Even though you find yourself in times of isolation and exile due to COVID-19 or whatever else has you in its grips, Even though the world seems so unsettled and so dysfunctional, God can use this time to change us and to grow us and to give us a fuller picture of who Jesus is and the hope that we can have through him just as John did on the island of Patmos. But we have to turn in toward him and not away from him. And that's my prayer for you and for me, that we get a greater glimpse of Jesus during this time of difficulty in our lives and that we fall at his feet, and that we fully surrender to all that we've been holding on besides him, and then we invite Jesus to take control of our lives. That, dear friends, is what brings us hope. That, dear friends, is what transforms our lives, and that is what changes the world. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful just for the richness of the text. And again, I mean, we shouldn't be surprised, but each time we open Scripture, we just see, God, that you are, you are revealed in just such powerful ways. And in this first chapter of Revelation, the final book of the Bible, John gives us this glimpse of the way that God demonstrates who Jesus is. And all of these qualities about Jesus that make him so majestic, so awe-inspiring, and that is Jesus that we can trust as our Savior. That is the Jesus that we can invite to guide us through our lives, through the good times and the more difficult. That's the Jesus that gives us hope. So thank you for this picture. And God, I just pray for this community, the community that I love so dearly. I just pray today that this, uh, this picture of Jesus is something that they grasp onto. It's a picture of Jesus that allows them to go into their day tomorrow and in the coming week just knowing and being reassured that Jesus has got this, that they're not alone, that Jesus is right there in the midst of their life and they can truly count on him. So thank you, God, for this time. Bless each one, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.